Today, I have the honor of welcoming up a man of many talents. He has over 25 years of experience in Christian higher education and a PhD in history from the University of Arkansas. He's someone who has consistent love for God and a consistent love for others. And he's been a blessing to me especially. Um, he reminds me of my high school principal, uh, someone who actually cares about his students, who isn't afraid to show his emotions and who isn't afraid to show his support. You'll see him on stage today, but no one's surprised to see him show up at a student's basketball game or a concert. He's never too big for any of us, and that's what I enjoy about him most. So please join me in welcoming my former professor and our president, Dr. Michael Hammond, to the stage. Okay. All right. Hey, Merry Christmas. Let's say that. Merry Christmas. Turn to your neighbor and say Merry Christmas. And where's my presents? All right. Well, um, we, are, uh, we are deep into uh, the holiday season. Today's December 1st. And, and uh, hopefully, um, how many of you have decorated your, your dorm room? Okay. A few of you are still cleaning out the, the fall decorations, I'm sure. But... Make sure you take time to enjoy, to decorate, to, to have fun with that. Um, today I'm, I'm going to talk a little bit about Christmas. Um, you might remember in October, I, I asked you to, to kind of wrestle through the question, uh, what, what is your rescue story? How do you tell the story of redemption in your own heart, in your own life? And then in November, I, I spoke and I said, okay, so what are you rescued to? What are you rescued for? What's your dream? And how do we dream uh, dreams in life? Um, and today, as we think about Christmas, the, the question I want to center around is, do you see the true light? Do you see the true light? Do you hear the true hum? <laughs> do, you, do you see the true light? <laughs> uh, so with that in mind, I, you know, tonight is the Christmas gala. Um, so thankful for, for how many, many of you. Yeah, thankful for many of you who put in so many hours of work to, to practice, to prepare, to decorate, to, to uh, be a part of that event, and um, just looking forward to that time. It's really, uh, the Christmas Gala is one of, it's not just one of those kind of big events we do here. Uh, I think it's probably one of the best ways that we show the love of Jesus to our neighbors. We, we invite people from all over the, the Boston area, the North Shore, to come. Um, you can see, I think it's even listed on this ad, the North Shore's largest Christmas celebration, it, it, you know, over two nights. Uh, the tree lighting will fill the, the kind of chapel mini quad out here with families. And so this is a moment for us as we think about Christmas. It's, a, it's one of those moments where um, because Christmas is, is in the common language, the vernacular, everybody kind of understands Christmas in our culture here. Um, it gives us opportunity to, to minister. It gives us opportunity to testify to God's goodness. And so this is one of those ways we do it. But as we think about the Christmas season, I, um, th there's all these, I mean, you're probably feeling the stress of this too. I, I did a little research. This is the National Retail Federation. And this bar graph is the, the historical um, graph on holiday sales. And but that last one is from uh, 2022. And, and this is, that number that it's measuring is 936.3 billion dollars. 936.3 billion dollars. And that's measured in retail sales just in the two months of sort of the holiday season, November and December. And as you can see, um, even if you can't make out the numbers on the graph, it, it's getting bigger every year. Uh, so we're almost to... Um, Whatever a thousand billion is, I need a math major to help me. Uh, but we're almost to that, that point of a trillion. Now that may make you kind of excited for Christmas somewhere. And, you know, again, if, if our numbers top that this year, there's, you know, $950 billion and a couple of those dollars are coming your way under the tree. That's exciting, right? And you may spend a few of those dollars on, on loved ones as well. But for many of us, and this is from a different group, the American Psychological Association, for many of us, the materialism of the Christmas season, the materialism and the, the kind of pressure, the stress, the expectations, the expectations that you 
decorate your dorm room. The expectations that you uh, have a cheerful heart and spirit. The expectations that you buy uh, or you're obligated to buy gifts for everybody you know. Those expectations and, and even the sort of inward thoughts about what Christmas brings to mind for many people can, can actually cause stress and anxiety. And so the American Psychological Association just asks a simple question. Is the holiday season more stressful uh, than other times of the year? And, uh, or does it increase or stay the same? 41% of respondents said, my stress level increases during the Christmas season, holiday season. 52% said it stays the same. And 7% said, oh, it decreases. <laughs> so 7% who just think of the holidays as this time of kind of reflection and refreshing. And that's what we all strive for and we, we hope and pray for. But that's such a small number to think of what a beautiful time of year this is and, 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 and what it is that we're actually thinking about and celebrating. And yet, those that responded to the survey, at least, only 7% said, oh, yeah, it helps me actually relax a little bit. 93% say it's either just as stressful or indeed even more stressful. Now, um, I, I know that that economic measure, we've all felt this, that economic measure is often fueled by Christmas music. Uh, so the shopping season, it does start, seems like November 1st. It keeps creeping you know, further into the summer at some point. Uh, we'll be uh, singing Christmas carols at the 4th of July and spending money uh, for our Christmas gifts at that point. Um, but I asked the other day, some of you, um, if you see my social media, I asked this question. Um, help me prep for chapel. What are the best and worst Christmas songs? Was happy to get a lot of responses on this. And um, as you might imagine, a pretty uh, big variety of Christmas songs. Um, uh, oftentimes someone said the absolute worst song is this one, and then the next message would say that's my favorite. I mean, people didn't know what each other were answering, but I just got to see all the answers. So I posted some of these, and, you, you know, you, you see, um, no one loves Grandma Got Run Over by a Reindeer. Everyone sort of agrees that that's um, you know, low culture. But some of you secretly love it, I know. Um, yeah, there's a few kind of modern interpretations, some old hymns, you know, Paul McCartney, uh, Maverick City. Um, a lot of believers still out there. Uh, you know who you are. Yeah, you know who you are. Uh, Mistletoe and his little drummer boy uh, version. A lot of people love the little drummer boy. It's a bit of, um, I mean, it's a bit of a, a divisive song. Some of you uh, actually wrote me a, a pretty clear interpretation theologically why some songs weren't accurate. Um, you see the one there? Mary knew, the angel told her. Okay, we get it. We'll, we'll drop the subject for now. Um, you know, the little drummer boy. There, I'm just going to say this. Um, there was no little drummer boy at the birth of Jesus. I'm sorry. It, it, it's a nice illustration of our simple gifts given to the Christ child. That's a good thing. Um, just don't ever convince yourself that it's somewhere in the Bible. You will not find it. But for a song, for an illustration of our, our love for Jesus, we'll, we'll, let it, we'll let it go. So music, in some ways, I think back to these two uh, surveys, you know, how much money we spend and how stressed we are. In some ways, music kind of fuels that shopping season, but hopefully music also can help frame our, our hearts toward um, the things that matter the most, even if it's just fun and fellowship with our families and our friends, and, and there's Christmas songs that we enjoy uh, singing together. The, the song that we sang today is actually one of my favorites, and, and um, I, I just, I throw some of the lyrics up here. I, I don't have the lyrics to, to the second verse, but to the third, uh, which we didn't sing. But, but I love this song, and it actually is one that helps me kind of, kind of reflect and to think about what it is this season really it, it, exist for, you know, what it is that we're, we're thinking about when we commemorate the coming Christ uh, to earth. Um, I love this, uh, it's the fourth line in that first verse, uh, till he appeared and the soul felt its worth, going back to the previous, the third line, long lay the world in sin and error pining or yearning, this, this concept that, that, that it illustrates for me of, of just how lost the world was without Jesus, just how lost we are and in darkness, essentially, not being able to navigate. 
that second verse that we sang talks about the light of the world, the light that, that shines to us. And you see this even at the end of the first verse. Yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. The, the, the richest sense of light coming into the darkness that we can really fathom is the stars, is the natural um, sunrise or the stars in the midst of the darkness of space. And uh, that, that sense of, of light that breaks the darkness, not just sort of softens it, but that it, it breaks through uh, is, is something that, that draws us back to this concept of Jesus as light. Um, verse 3, I love, his law is love, his gospel is peace. Chains shall he break. And in his name, oppression shall cease. What a beautiful way to think about the love that Jesus has for us. Not just the love that makes us feel all gooey inside, but the love that breaks the chains of oppression. I could sit down right now and you got your money's worth today, right? So thank you for this, this hymn. But let me go on. Um, I do have some more to say. So for me, this is just one example. And for, for many of you, um, you may have other songs that bring that sense of deep reflection and draw you back to what it is that matters. But I, I have to believe that we still wrestle with materialism. We still wrestle with stress and anxiety, even in the midst of these moments when we may catch a, a good conversation or a, a, we, we hear something in, in a worship service or we, we, we sing at that moment and those words draw us back to, to who Jesus is. We still struggle with that. This is not surprising. And in fact, this idea, that the question I have for you today, do you see the true light? It comes from the passage in John 1. John 1, verse 9. The true light that gives light to everyone was coming into the world. This is about the, the, the arrival of Jesus into the world. Now there's many metaphors for, for Jesus throughout the scriptures. And even in chapter 1 of John. But this idea of true light, you see it reflected, no pun intended, in those hymns as we, we call back to this idea of the light that breaks through the darkness, that breaks the chains of oppression, the coming Christ that, that did away from the burden of the law for all time and blessed us with the love and grace that only Jesus could give. That's our redemption story, our rescue story, as you know. Isaiah 9, 2 prophesied about the coming of Christ. It said, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. In those, in the land living in deep darkness, a light has dawned. This, this imagery is rich. This passage goes on. In verse 10, he was in the world and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. The creator of the universe, Jesus, fully God, and as we see in, in the sense of the miracle, the incarnation, fully man, came to the world that he himself had knit together, had created out of nothing. And the world didn't know who this guy was. Now this isn't just John's historical account of what he witnessed as one of Christ's disciples. This is the living scripture that tells us today struggles that we have. That same Jesus who came in the flesh is that same Jesus that lives in each of us today if we call ourselves his children. And he makes this possible. Verse 12, to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. We talked about Romans 8 last month, that idea that, that we are co-heirs, joint heirs, we're, we're, we're sons and daughters of God as Jesus gives us that entry into relationship with the Father. And here again, when we think about what is happening when we commemorate Jesus' arrival at Christmas, what is it that we're focused on? There's so many things that are our, our stress and our anxiety and our materialism and our spending are going to tell us are vital and important. And some of those are not necessarily bad. But the degree to which they take our hearts away from a recognition of the reality of the miracle of the coming of Jesus, they serve us no good. And this is where it all comes together in verse 14. 
the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. This chapter starts, many of you know, John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. The word Jesus. Remember the Trinity. This is difficult sometimes for us to understand. How is he fully God and fully man? How did he come to earth and take on fleshly form while not sacrificing his right place as God? And yet this is the miracle. This is the true light. This is the light that we need to see. And so my reminder to all of us this time of year is in the midst of everything happening, celebrate, have fun, go to the parties, enjoy good food, sing good songs, but don't miss the miracle. Because what we talk about as people of Jesus, what we talk about when we talk about the coming of the Christ child, it can look cute and syrupy and we have ornaments on our trees and nativity scenes up in our rooms in our house. And we can miss the reality and the power of what's happening in that moment. The miracle of the incarnation. As I say, it sometimes it's difficult to wrestle through concepts like the Trinity and concepts like the incarnation, the idea that Jesus, fully God, could also take on flesh and become fully man. And if that's difficult for you to wrestle through, understand that you're not alone. This is deeply rooted in the history of followers of Jesus, in the history of the Christian church. The Nicene Creed, this is refined in 381, but first uh, put together at the Council of Nicaea in 325. 300 bishops from all across Christendom, all across the Christian world in the 4th century met to, to settle the, the heresy of Arianism that, that suggested that Christ couldn't be fully God. That there had to be some kind of subordinate relationship for Jesus to even take on flesh. And if you're not familiar with the creed, some of you have been reciting it your whole life, but if you're not familiar with it, uh, understand that the words here are to reflect the richness of passages like 1 John. The richness of, and the complexity and the great miracle of what happens when Jesus comes to earth. As you read through the creed, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is, seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made. Important distinction here. The Son, the Father, the Holy Spirit, distinct members of the Trinity, and yet not one of them subordinate to the other. Begotten, not made of being one with the Father. Through him all things were made for us men and for our salvation. Remember 1 John. He came to the world of which he created and they knew him not. The creation of the world implicit. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. Stop there for a second. If you've recited this your whole life, and, and again, with deep meaning, or maybe sometimes as a ritual, understand what you're saying here. Became incarnate of the Virgin Mary and was made man. That's crazy talk. Do you even know what you're saying? It's crazy talk to a world that does not believe in a God that does miracles. It's crazy talk to a world that doesn't believe that the power of the Holy Spirit rests in each of you right now. It's crazy talk to a world that is, is in love with skepticism and reason. And our responsibility as believers is to testify to this miracle. It's to see this miracle. It's to open our eyes to the true light. And to bring people into that place where, where, where the miraculous God who created our minds and allows us to have reason also rules over our hearts today. And why? Because Jesus, being fully God, took on the nature of man, became an incarnate being, became flesh, and dwelt among us. 
Did Jesus feel anxiety at Christmas? That's a crazy question. But did he feel anxiety that you feel? Believe that he did. We sometimes become so enamored with our own popularity, our own uh, wisdom of, of the age. We think, well, Jesus couldn't have been that sophisticated. He didn't drive a car in Boston traffic. He didn't have a cell phone. He didn't surf. Well, maybe he did. There's all these ways that we want to think that, that our, our age is so much more progressive and so much beyond what Jesus lived in. And there's ways that that's true. But when he took on flesh, he took on all the, the, the utterings, the temptations, everything that you deal with. So that he could live a life free from sin and in his righteousness could become the sacrifice for your life and your redemption. The great uh, theologian John Stott once put it this way to pull it together. So the divinity of Christ, the humanity of Christ, and the righteousness of Christ uniquely qualify him to be man's redeemer. If he had not been man, he could not have redeemed men. If he had not been a righteous man, he could not have redeemed unrighteous men. And if he had not been God's son, he could not have redeemed men, for God made them sons of God. What does all that mean? The point to not drift away from in this season, to not miss that miracle, the incarnation, is that Jesus loved you enough to come to live that sinless life, to take on flesh, to bear the burden of your sin on the cross, to be resurrected, and to live continually in our hearts. Don't miss that miracle as we think about this Christmas season. There was a, a time I can remember distinctly when our uh, family was much younger. I was much younger as well. Anyway, uh, a few years back. And I was probably... Um, on that anxiety chart would have said, this is much more stressful than the rest of the year. I was just feeling the stress of it. And I remember sort of muttering to myself, man, Christmas drives me crazy. Wow. Some of you may be there too. Because Christmas right now, as, as you're a student, Christmas also kind of overlaps in that Venn diagram of, uh, of your life into finals for, for, for your classes. And and due dates for your projects. For our faculty members, it cor correlates with getting their grades in on time. It's stressful. And you may be muttering to yourself, man, this time of year, Christmas drives me crazy. So one thing that's helped me over the years as we, as we reflect on this painting, which I love, um, is, is to, to really adopt a, an Advent approach to the Christmas season. Some of you, again, this is familiar to you. You grew up in a liturgical church, or, or even if you didn't, a lot of churches practice Advent, lighting the candles for hope and love and peace and joy, celebrating week by week the, the coming of Christ. The, the, the traditions of Advent go way back into the history of the church as well. Uh, at one point, it was sort of a 40 days of, of fasting and prayer to prepare people's hearts for the, the season of Christ's coming, but also to, to prepare their hearts as they think about Christ's second coming, Christ's return, and the hereafter. Um, for most of us today, we, we think December 1st, that kind of starts Advent. Some of you may have grown up with little Advent calendars. You kind of open the door, there's a little piece of candy or a you know, the Lego calendar, that was the great one, right? You open it up and you build the little Christmas set. There's all kinds of ways that this has also been commercialized for $950 billion. But anyway, um, for, for me, this Advent approach, and, and even uh, for our family, thinking about the celebration of Epiphany, the, the extension of Christmas into the new year that um, is commemorated in songs like the 12 Days of Christmas. But that idea that we remember the coming of Christ, the incarnation, and also 
the, uh, the celebration of Christ by, by those who came to visit him, the wise men and so forth. It, 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 it's a way to, to prepare our hearts so that in the midst of this busyness, we're actually defensively pushing back against the temptations to anxiety, the temptations to materialism. It also means that, that you know, and that may work for you. For, for me, it works great. It helps to just be in prayer, to do some specific readings, to think clearly about what Advent means. But it also reminds me again and again of the miracle of the Incarnation, the coming of the true light that Jesus took on flesh so that he could help us and empower us to push back against the darkness, to take on those moments where we, we, we vigilantly preserve the, the reality of worshiping Christ in that moment and beholding the miracle that he, that he performed by coming to us. I'm going to close in prayer in a minute, but I ask you to think as you look at this painting, as you think about this season, as you think about the stress that you're going under right now. Some of you may be really having a hard time as we wrap up the semester. As we bow our heads together, I just want to ask you to take a moment to ask God to reveal to you what it is in your heart that's pushing you away from witnessing the true light. What it is during this season that causes you so much stress or anxiety, pressure, that you might indeed miss the miracle. Let's pray. Father, we're so grateful for your good gifts to us and the, the miracle of Jesus' birth, the incarnation, the, the miracle of coming to redeem us, to redeem me. Lord, help me not to miss that. And Father, as we pray together in our hearts, we lay these things at your feet. We surrender to you those self-serving ways that we would operate our lives, that would take our eye away from witnessing the true light. We trust you to, to heal us, to redeem us from sin, to empower us by your spirit, and to celebrate the beauty of this miraculous season, Lord. Pray for each person here as they lay these things at your feet. We love you. In your name we pray. Amen. Hey, Merry Christmas, you all. Have a great day. We'll see you.